All righty. Let's get this show on the road, huh? Oh, Lordy, I got to fix that. Hold on. I'm getting a bad echo in my headset. One second, guys. Okay, for now, we are just going to do this. Okay. That should be it. All right. Um, we're going to have to play around with things a little bit here. Ooh. I have not streamed in quite some time, guys. I took a nice long break um, from painting in general. So bear with me as we uh, get kind of things sorted back out, what we're gonna do here and all of that good stuff. Um, where's my video box? There we go. I think we're about right there. Let me take a look here. What's this like? Yeah, that's about right. Alrighty. Um, all right. Looks like we've got a few people in here. Um, first off, uh, uh, I've been airbrushing almost as long as I've been painting, which isn't like super duper long, especially compared to some people like uh, James Wapple and, and Calvo who've been doing some form of painting of effectively their entire lives. Um, you know, but but real shortly after I started painting, I thought, you know what sounds really fun is airbrushing. And I contacted uh, a local airbrush artist who was not a mini artist. Oh, hold on. I realized this got, there we go. Um, I contacted a local artist who, uh, first of all, can everybody hear me? If somebody on the chat who might be able to type, if somebody can type and say whether or not you can hear me, that'd be great. Um, so yeah, I contacted a local artist and said, Hey, uh, you know, I'd love to, to learn how to airbrush and I'm going to be airbrushing minis. And this, uh, this particular local artist who, who was an airbrush artist, not a miniature artist said, you are insane. No one in their right mind would ever airbrush a miniature. That's absolutely silly. Why would you want to do that? Just use a brush. And I was like, well, um, lots of miniature artists do that. So I feel like it's not insane. Um, so I already had an airbrush and oh my gosh, I struggled with that silly thing forever. Like it felt like all I did was struggle with it. And, um, you know, the dilution was never right or, you know, all it would do is spider web on me or whatever. Finally ran across a local artist, um, Scott. I will, uh, I'll throw a link to Scott, um, on my webpage after this. And turns out he's an amazing airbrush artist, does miniatures, been doing this kind of stuff forever and, uh, sat down with him and, and ended up him teaching me a lot of stuff. Um, I'll be covering a lot of the stuff that, that he taught and, and ever since then airbrush is, is just part of my workflow like my I got a little airbrush stand that sits here on the desk um, everything's always ready to go um, I have a dedicated hobby space um, in a part of the house that nobody cares what happens to so I don't have a spray booth um, if you don't if you need a dedicated space uh, well, if you need to not overspray and ruin stuff, please, please, please just get a spray booth. They're about a hundred dollars. It's basically a booth that, uh, has a, a suction fan and you can spray in and nothing happens. Um, so what you need to airbrush is you obviously need an airbrush. Badger is running their annual birthday sale uh, in just two days on the 4th. And they will be allowing any of their brushes that range anywhere from, you know, 65 to, you know, $120 or whatever to be sold for uh, $56 plus, I think, some fees or whatever. It's a slightly good deal on some brushes it's a fantastic deal on other brushes um the only issue is it's going to take several months for for you to get them in you can't be in a hurry um 
The brush we're going to be focused on today is um, called the Badger Extreme Patriot Arrow. Um, the Extreme Patriot is basically the overall design of this brush. And then the arrow on these brushes just means that it has uh, a smaller cup. So if you see arrow on a badger brush, it just means it has a smaller cup, basically. The extreme refers to this little valve down here, some coatings, stuff like that. It's not a, uh, a major part of it at all. The Patriot is the overall model and design. Um, I'm gonna go over the, the parts of an airbrush real quick here. Um, I am going to somewhat disassemble the airbrush right now. Um, it, you get a lot of people who tell you that every time at the end of airbrushing they completely disassemble their airbrush and clean it head to toe. Oh my goodness, you do not need to do that. Like you you absolutely don't need to do that. It's it's completely unnecessary. So I'm gonna start um, disassembling now and we'll go over how an airbrush works so that you've got a good idea of it. And then we'll uh, go over, you know, what each part does and everything. Um, this uh, this piece back here really is just to keep you from hitting all this junk. Um, this The airbrush operates perfectly fine without this. I'm not going to claim to know any kind of technical names for things. I know what they do. I don't necessarily always know what they're called or whatever. Um, so this nut right here controls whether or not the needle here slides in and out. So you tighten that, I can't pull the needle out, okay? So we untighten that, we pull the needle out. Okay, this is the needle. Badger needles have a ball on their end that tells you what size the needle is, okay? Um, you can look at the tip and you can tell if it's bent, if it's broken, anything like that, okay? Um, this is the trigger when when the needle is out you can pull the trigger out when it's in you can't pull the trigger out it's got a hole you can see this kind of hole right there that the needle actually slides through to prevent it from coming out okay this particular piece right here is a spring-loaded piston that the the, the uh that the trigger activates against, that you press it against, and it provides the pressure and the, the kind of trigger action. So you can see how that's spring-loaded. If you were to disassemble, there's no reason to ever take this apart. Unless you're experiencing some sort of weird stickiness or the spring breaks or something, there's no reason to ever disassemble this assembly. You, you just don't need to. Okay, um, you can see this is this is actually keyed in one direction, so it's difficult to tell on camera. But you can only you basically it only it only slides right in one. If you find that your trigger won't pull back all the way once you get it in, this piece may not be um, fitted perfectly, and you may need to spin this until it slides in correctly. Okay. Okay, this, this little piece in here, okay, this is what presses against this piston down here that we just took out, okay, and it presses against the trigger. It kind of provides the point of contact there. Um, if you put this in backwards, uh, it can be a little confusing, and you might not know why it works. Okay, I'm not going to take this off just because in a really you don't ever need to like um, This particular piece right here is The male part of a quick disconnect what that means is is instead of screwing and unscrewing my air hose I just get to press it in like that and pop it off like that super handy honestly if you buy an airbrush you should get a quick disconnect um, otherwise what happens is every time you go to unscrew your airbrush from your hose what's going to happen is uh, this hose is is effectively going to be empty on the end and your compressor is going to kick on and everything's going to drain and it's a giant pain in the butt okay all right this is the paint cup right we put paint in there um, I'm going to disassemble the head now. Okay. Okay, so in here, this is the nozzle. Okay, what this, what this does is it directs the flow of, of paint and everything. When you hear about 
airbrush is getting clogged, it's usually this piece right here. Some airbrushes have a super duper tiny one of these. Um, the Sotar, which is another uh, badger brush, has a absolutely microscopic um, nozzle compared to the Patriot. Um, the Patriots are also what, what we call self-centering, which means um, they don't screw in unlike an Awada. An Awada has these really tiny, delicate threads, and you have to very carefully thread them on. And one of the most common things you see with Awada is, is if somebody over-tightens it or they cross-thread it, and now they've, they've ruined a nozzle just because of that. What happens is, due to the shape of, of the, the base, of the nozzle here, all you have to do is rest it on there and as everything screws back down, it's going to uh, seal and seat correctly. You don't have to do anything special with that. Okay, we can disassemble. This is this is two pieces right here. This is the cap and I, I believe this is called the head. I'd have to, to look it up. So if you look right there, you've got a series of tiny holes. Okay, so what happens is air comes up through here and then travels along a tube inside of here and if you look see that hole that's where the air comes out paint comes out this bigger hole okay and then it goes through I'm gonna put this back on okay and it goes inside what's basically a chamber that's right in here okay that, that exists between this little dot and these air holes that are letting air comes out. So paint comes out the nozzle here and air comes out. It mixes up in here and then it sprays out along the path of the needle, okay? So what the nozzle here does is it determines how fine of a particle will fit through. Okay, when you hear about a 0.2 or a 0.3 or a 0.5, what that's really talking about is the nozzle size. It means that that size uh, particle will be able to fit through the nozzle, okay? That actually doesn't refer to the needle, okay? Needles are actually a, a whole separate thing. You can actually use a mismatched needle in most airbrushes. Um, in, in fact, this is a mismatched needle. This is a uh, like a super detail needle, which is their, their smallest needle with a uh, larger size, I think a, a D, what they call a detail, which is a 0.3 size nozzle. What that allows me to do is spray a little larger things, but I get a narrower path. Um, there's some advantages and disadvantages of that. We can talk about some other time though. All right, so now we're gonna start reassembling. I already did a little bit, okay? Alrighty, so I put that back on there, right? You just want to make sure that's on there. You slide this over, and all we're doing is reversing here. You can tell me it took, what, two or three minutes to uh, to take that apart? I mean, maybe a little longer because I was explaining everything. All we're doing is screwing everything back on. We're doing finger tight. Do not, do not take a set of tools and crank stuff down. If you need to crank it down to get something to seal, then something isn't right. Okay, if you're having to take tools and just to get something to seal, you've got something else wrong. Um, we can talk about how to tell if what's what else is going wrong and stuff like that. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take this piece and we're gonna make sure that this is, is turned the right direction so that it slides. I'm trying to get, the, ah, there we go. There's a flat piece, there we go. We're making sure that that, if you hold this vertical, it's, it's, it's gonna be a lot easier. So what you wanna do is hold this vertical and then just grip this piston and thread that back in there. And it will stop when it stops. It always takes a lot longer to thread this for some reason. Like, I always feel like it comes out really fast and then takes forever. What you wanna do is you wanna keep making sure that this pulls back, okay? If you get to the point that that won't pull back, then you've managed to, to lose that little D. Then what you do is you pull, this is how I do it, okay? You pull that, you take this, the curved thing goes back towards the piston, but slide this piece up to the front, okay? Curved, cur it curves this way, okay? 
and then that piece goes up front. Okay, what that allows you to do is you can see now that curved part is pressing against that piston so it can rock. Okay, then what we're going to do is we're going to put the trigger there. We're going to go ahead and put this on there. Um, every airbrush is usually slightly different, but this is effectively the mechanism for all of them. At this point, you want to make sure that the trigger is seated correctly. What happens is the end of it, if you look, has this little dimple. You can see this little dimple. What it does is it sits up on this little piston right there and presses it down. Okay, so when you put this trigger in, make sure that the holes are facing this way, not this way. So don't put that, that in like that. Otherwise, what's going to happen is when you hit the, when you push the needle in, it's going to hit this and you're going to bend your needle. Okay, so this is a really important step to not getting a bent needle. Okay, what you want to do is get that, that in there and make sure that you have some spring action there. As long as you've got spring action, when you go to put your needle through, it's gonna slide in that hole. If you don't have spring action, something's off, and when you go to put that needle through, you're gonna bend the needle, okay? So loosen this slightly, okay, slide this in, okay? If you guys have any questions, please ask as I'm doing things. And what you want to do is slide this in just until it stops. Don't jam it. Don't force it. If something hangs to where it won't slide in, um, uh, just take things and backtrack, figure out what you did wrong, and come back to it. If you start forcing stuff, then you're going to bend and break something. Okay, this is this is a precision instrument. It's not hard. Nothing I've done so far is hard, guys. Okay, all we've done is take things apart, put things back together. Piece of cake, right? Okay, so at this point, you want to screw this again. Finger tight. Do not over tighten this. What happens if you really try to crank this down is you can tighten this to the point that it's tighter than the threads in here. And when you go to try to unscrew this, you'll unscrew this whole... Uh, mechanism and that's just a pain in the butt so don't do this you just need this just just finger tight it's just there to keep that back so at this point you should be able to yeah see the the needle moving that's what you want okay all right so you can see when I pull that back that comes back what that's doing is it's allowing a bigger and bigger gap to form there the needle when when everything is is not pulled back here what happens is the the diameter of the needle forms a seal against the diameter of that nozzle and nothing is allowed out as soon as you pull back um, the needle is tapered okay so what happens is as it pulls back it exposes a bigger and a bigger uh, gap in that that nozzle okay and allows more and more paint to come through okay um, so now what happens is we hook up air. I have a um, quick change with an air pressure. Uh, it, it's technically not pressure, it's airflow. So it's, a, it's an airflow dial, um, but it allows me to adjust things easier than otherwise. All right, so I don't know if you guys can hear. Can you guys hear? Yeah. Okay, you should have air there. Okay, the first thing you wanna do after you've put your airbrush back together, don't put paint in it, don't do anything. You need to put some water in it, make sure everything's working fine. Don't put cleaner in it, don't do anything. Just put a little bit of water. These are squirt bottles. They are fantastic for having airbrush stuff. Um, I think I got mine on Amazon. You might be able to get them at Hobby Lobby. Uh, they're not expensive. Um, pick some up. Uh, I recommend two, one for just uh, plain water, um, one for airbrush cleaner. So um, this is just water. So what we're looking for here is first of all, when we spray, we don't wanna see bubbles in the cup. Okay, if it starts to bubble up there, that means you've got a blockage or something isn't sealed here. What that means is that air is not escaping properly out the front end. Um, okay. Um, if it starts to bubble up, then air is not escaping properly out the front end. It's feeding back along the paint, uh, the paint channel that we showed earlier, the bigger gap down there. It's feeding back along there and coming out here. That's not what we want, okay? That means that something's wrong. Um, you need to take things apart, 
screw things back together, make sure everything's set. If everything's still um, bubbling, what probably means is you have a blockage in your uh, nozzle. You're gonna have to, to clean your nozzle. We can talk about that a little later. Then what we're looking for is we want when, when you just press air down, nothing should be coming out the front, okay? If you press air down, and, and water starts to come out right now, what that means is that either your nozzle is deformed or you haven't seated. I think you're hearing my uh, compressor kick on, hopefully not too loudly. Um, so if air comes out, if water comes out as you're spraying, okay, right now, and you haven't pulled the trigger back, um, then what that means is you might not have pushed the nasal needle far back enough or you've blown out the front of your nozzle okay if that's the case you just have to replace the nozzle they're not expensive that's one of the best things about badger parts they're stupid cheap to replace like it's crazy compared to other brands you'll spend three or four times the amount of money on some of the other brands for for replacement nozzles and stuff then what you want to do so what we've done the the test for no bubbles we've done the test that nothing's coming out now we want to start pulling back so you should be able to see a bit of a thing there. What we should see is a little, a little more, and then as we pull back, it should go a lot. And that's what we're looking for. We should also see that it's not, it's not gonna be curving up or curving down. And then as we look from this, it should not go left or right. If it goes up, down, left, or right, what that means is you've got a bent tip on your needle, and the needle is basically arcing the, the spray in one direction. Okay, that doesn't mean that you have to immediately stop everything. What that means is you probably need to replace the needle. But if you can adjust your workflow to where it's aiming, it, it might work for you. Um, bent needles tend to collect a little bit and they splatter, so so I don't recommend using them. But it, but it can uh, it can be fine in a pinch. All right, so at this point, we're just going to spray the water out. All right, so we've assembled our brush. We know how to use it. Um, I talked a little bit about this valve. So this is full blast right now. If I want to, I'm gonna put a little bit water in here and we'll see what happens as I crank this down. Okay, so this is full blast. And then as I start to crank this down, you can see I'm not changing anything on the trigger, but it's changing the amount of air coming out. Okay, normally to do that, what would have to happen is you would need to go over to the airbrush compressor and start adjusting uh, the pressure on the knob. That's a pain in the butt to do when you're in the middle of a project, you're reaching down, you're doing it. My airbrush compressor is actually across the room. Um, I think I need to get it replaced. It's a little noisy for, for, for what it is. Um, but it's actually across the room. I got like a, like a 10 foot hose on and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, so at this point we have a functional airbrush, okay? This is more than a lot of people end up. By, by the time they go to do something with their first airbrush, they've been told they need to strip it down and, and rebuild it, and strip it down and rebuild it. And by the time they've done that, they've managed to, to screw something up and they no longer have a functional airbrush. You can see if you take your time, it's, it's actually pretty easy to do, okay? Nothing that we just did was hard. Um, I don't happen to have one, uh, but but it's actually good to have a little tray here where you can lay everything down as, or a paper or a towel or something to keep things rolling away. Uh, it's one of those things I should I should do. I just I don't. Um, but that way it's it's harder to um, to lose pieces as we disassemble and reassemble. All right. So let's go on to uh, uh, a couple of topics um, before we start putting some paint down to, to see what that means. All right, one of the things you, you, you hear a lot about, uh, there's two terms is dilution and PSI. So people are always like, how much should I dilute my paints and how much, uh, what, what PSI should I be spraying at? Um, so I'm going to give you the most, um, ambiguous answer probably that I will ever give to any question and that's it depends because no two people airbrush alike I've never met two people that airbrush even remotely to be honest remotely the same as another um, I've had airbrushing from uh, the, the guy I learned from Scott uh, Sergio Calvo, Aaron Lovejoy, uh, several different people, and uh, none of them airbrush like each other, and I don't airbrush like any of them. 
So the, the reality is there's not really a wrong way to do this. You just have to figure out a workflow that makes yourself comfortable. But what I am going to do is show you what works for me and how you might want to, to change it if you don't like it and, and what the different things mean. All right. So PSI, what that is, is the pressure. PSI means how much pressure of air is traveling along this tube to make things blow out. If you've got too little, let's say I crank this way down, okay, and I'm not doing anything. Basically, let me put something in there. Basically, if I crank that so low, nothing's going to come out, okay? If I crank it all the way up, a lot of times that's too much. You don't necessarily want all that, okay? That's a lot of paint to come out at one time. Okay, I just realized I've been spraying all this where my phone is. I think my phone is soaked. That's not good. Okie dokie. Um, okay, so PSI refers to um, how much pressure is coming through. Um, a lot of times what you'll hear is that the common PSI for a lot of people to work around is 20. Um, 20 is a decent mix for um, good atomization. So when the atomization refers to how fine of the particles um, of, of the paint is coming out here, if it's, if it's uh, highly atomized or very atomized, what that means is a very fine mist. If it's not very atomized, it's think bigger droplets. Okay, 99.9% .9 of the time in uh, mini painting, we want um, good atomization. We want we want relatively high atomization because one of the reasons you're probably using an airbrush is to get those smooth blends. If it comes out big and chunky and plunky, you're not going to get smooth blends, right? Um, 20 is where a lot of people start. 20 is where a lot of people stay. Okay, some people, um, if you're trying to do really fine detail work, you might end up <laughs> in my phone. I'm pretty sure my phone's okay. Um, uh, if you're trying to do real fine detail work, you might go as low as 12, okay? Any lower than that, it's going to start to get hard to, um, to get proper atomization or even enough air coming out to move the paint. Um, exactly how low you can go depends a lot on your dilution. That's the next term we're talking about. Dilution refers to, um, oh, let me back it up to PSI one more time. Um, PSI, so a lot of people are 20, some people go as low as 12. I'm gonna tell you right now, um, I, I often end up around 35 to 40, and somebody's like, oh my gosh, that's insane. Yes, but it also provides amazing atomization. And that's one thing that, that uh, I got from, from Aaron Lovejoy's uh, when he did airbrushing was he's like, yeah, so I, I like it uh, actually when it's higher PSI. And I was like, what? That's madness. And then you do it for a while and you're like, holy cow, this, this actually kind of works. Like once you get used to it and once you kind of do that, what happens is it kind of solves a lot of issues. What it doesn't work though, if you need to get in there and do really fine lines and really small detail work with super thin paint, it, it doesn't work too well. You still need to crank it down for some of that stuff. But a lot of that is not necessarily um, what the airbrush is suited for. The airbrush is not necessarily the right tool for every job. Um, you know, it's just another tool in your box. Don't ever think that just because you do something with the airbrush, you have to do everything. Sorry, I'm taking a drink, guys. Tonight's drink of choice, by the way, is Bailey's. Um, so don't ever think that you have to do everything with an airbrush or that just because you're learning with an airbrush um yep right um so yeah don't ever think that this that you're confined to the tool once you start with it or that you should be able to do something with an airbrush use it when when it's appropriate okay so dilution um everybody dilutes to a different uh strength okay when something is very diluted what it means is it's very little paint to a lot of thinner 
okay when something is not very diluted it means that that you've got a lot of paint and very little thinner um some people don't dilute very much at all aaron lovejoy is one of them aaron lovejoy if, if he can i i he he'll run it as full strength as possible he likes it to just crank out he likes he likes a lot of paint um to come out there um and that, that works for his style, what he likes to do it. Sergio Calvo is the exact opposite. He he goes super thin, but he also goes very low PSI. He's got this whole test where you're like spraying it against your hand, and if it makes a dimple on your hand, then uh, it's like the size of the dimple. So how much dilution, how much PSI, totally up to you. Um, What's weird is I kind of ended up with a with a cross between two of them. I usually go high PSI but low dilution. So what that means is I get really good atomization, um, but I don't necessarily have good coverage. But I'm not looking for it normally. Normally, um, I would rather be subtle with an airbrush and do multiple passes and build it up a little bit, then kind of put all your eggs in one basket. Um, in, unless you're base coating or something, you just need to throw paint down. Um, when you go full dilution with something, what, what happens is, is two things. Um, you're gonna get a lot more clogs. Honestly, when you go uh, full dilution, you're gonna get a lot more clogs. The paint's thicker, it's just, it's bound to happen. It's, it's, it's not if, it's when. Um, and when you go to do some sort of effect um, after you've done a little bit on the mini, you get one shot. If your paint is full strength and um, you're putting it down after you've spent 10 hours on a mini and you've lined it up and you've got it just where you want it and you miss by a little bit or whatever, you know what, guess what? Is there now and there's nothing. If it's if it's a weak dilution, you might not even really notice too much because when you're working with a weak dilution, what you're gonna do is you're gonna do a lot of little, you're gonna do little bursts and you're gonna build it up and you're gonna be real gradual with everything, okay? It's just different workflows nothing's right about one way nothing's wrong about one way okay um i don't even always dilute sometimes um you know i'm, I'm going a lot more full strength uh i don't measure my dilution ever i'm never like two drops of paint one drop of of thinner two drops of paint four drops or whatever you'll see me in in a few minutes i'm going to put a couple of drops in and i just kind of squirt some in there because it doesn't really matter that much because I'm going to do multiple passes anyways. As long as I feel like it's thin enough, then I don't really have to worry about it. Um, so let me think. Uh, what do we got next? Coverage trigger. Let's let's cover trigger. Okay. So most airbrushes actually have a much lower trigger. The trigger is about this high instead of this high. This is the Badger High Roller Trigger. Okay, what this means is that you have a longer throw. Okay, throw refers to how far you've got to pull to get an action. Okay, so you actually have to exert more force on this more and more distance to cover the same amount. That's actually a good thing. Why is that a good thing? Because what it means is instead of a little bit doing a lot to the needle, it takes more, more, action to do things to the needle so it gives you more precision okay um, if you're a professional airbrush artist and you're gonna be airbrushing for let's say 20 hours or eight hours a day or something like that it might not be the choice for you because it is going to wear out faster it's gonna wear your muscles out your fingers gonna be going to be killing by the end of it if you're doing that for eight hours if you're a hobbyist like most of us or you're you're not airbrushing um for hours and hours and hours this is a this is a great happy medium because it allows you to gain a lot more control without it um so let's let's talk about how you actually use uh the trigger and whatever this is not an aerosol spray can right this is an airbrush okay this is this is what we think of as a precision tool okay you're almost never going to take and just do this i i can't no like don't do that this that's not 
an effective way because what happens when that, I'm just drying the mini off here, you can use your airbrush as kind of a blow dryer. Just spray it. I'm not spraying anything out, I'm just spraying air. Um, so what happens when you when you just start going like that is the paint starts to pool up. Okay, when the paint starts to pool up, then you got issues. Okay, uh, when you try to spray wet paint on wet paint is when you get a lot of issues. When you when you do that, what happens is it, it, it either spiders or pools or a whole number of issues. Okay, so uh, the the technique that that a lot of artists use. Um, I think this this might be universal. I don't know. I'd have to think about that. Um, is we're talking about little bitty. See, all I'm doing is air and then just a little pullback. Okay. There's a lot of variations on it. Um, I can't remember exactly what what Aaron does. I can't remember if he does. Uh, what what I'm doing or whatever. I think he calls it 10% pulls. Um, Calvo does this motion where he keeps the trigger down and then rocks it back like that. So he's 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 constantly doing air paint, air paint, air paint, air paint. Okay, that takes a lot of dexterity and a lot of practice to get that right. Um, for me, I tend to just let go the the whole time. Okay. When oh this is this is one thing I, I almost forgot. When you are operating an airbrush, it's push down then pull back. Okay, it's not pull back push down. If you do that, what's going to happen is you're going to get a huge blob of paint coming off. Okay, so it's push down pull back. You also, if you can help it, don't start your air painted at the mini. So. You don't want to do that. You want to start your air somewhere else, move it to the mini, and then come. Okay? Not not every time. It depends on the color. But, but what happens is, especially on some colors, is um, whites are notorious about this. They will collect on the tip of your airbrush. And when you let go, okay, um, if you... If you cut the air off before it blows that off and it collects on the tip and you've got it pointed at the model and you press that air again, what's going to happen is you're going to get these, these specks of white that fly off at the model. So what you need to either do is push, rock, and let go. Okay, if you do it like that, then nothing's going to happen. I'm notoriously bad about doing that to be honest with you um, but the correct way is down back forward up down back forward up down back forward up what that does is it keeps it from collecting on the tip um, but if you've managed to collect some on the tip for because you're bad like me um, and you have it pointed and you and you give that full air it's going to shoot off at the model and that's going to be a real problem okay um, so what you want to practice with is short strokes. Don't go full blast. If you start going full blast, okay, you're, you're not going to be happy. It's it's too much paint for the kind of models we're talking about. Okay, that's for that's I I don't know. That's if you need um, if you're clearing a clog, maybe if you, I I don't know. Um, if you're just exhausting what's in there. Yeah, so that's trigger control, okay? After we cover a lot of this stuff, we're gonna part, start putting some paint on the model here, um, just to kind of show you how, how you do this. Um, so we're gonna cover two more topics real quick and then we'll get to a model. Um, practice, how do you practice with an airbrush? How do you get this trigger control? Okay, uh, the guy who taught me, Scott, uh, best thing he ever did was not do a model. He got out a sheet of paper, like a copy sheet of paper, and he had me write my name and do dashes and dots. Write my name, dashes, dots. All these different exercises on paper so that my hand and my finger got used to the muscle memory of how it does it. And until you can write your name in cursive, 
over and over again and have it look appropriate and do dashes and, and dots of different sizes until you can do those kinds of, of things on a porous two-dimensional surface. It's never going to go well if you try to put it on a non-porous model. So um, he had me do that and then I went home and I started putting some paint on a model and immediately got frustrated. Why? Because um, it was not the same level of porous surface. So I figured out another trick. I grabbed a milk jug. It was an empty milk jug. You could grab a water bottle. Anything that is not a porous surface but has got some, some canvas to it basically. You could take a piece of card, uh, uh, PV, uh, what, do, what do we call it, plastic card. There we go, plastic card. And I primed it. And then I repeated those same exercises of doing that on a hard porous surface. What that allowed me to do was, was figure out the right level of air for what I wanted to do. Okay, that got me a lot of control on the trigger. And there are times I will still just spend 10, 15 minutes getting a sheet of paper out, writing my name, get a sheet of paper out, writing my name. If you wanna get, get better at this kind of stuff, it takes a little bit of practice. Okay, cleaning. This is a somewhat controversial topic. Um, what happens when you need to clean your airbrush? You're gonna see me clean the airbrush when we go to put paint in the model. I'm not gonna do it right now, so I'll be covering in more detail then. Um, but there's basically two to three schools of thought. thought. Um, some people disassemble after every time, uh, clean it out with with all sorts of ridiculous picks and um, brushes and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, you don't need to do that. It is 100% not necessary. Just a second. So, um, you don't need to do that at all. Some people uh, stick it in an ultrasonic uh, cleaner every night again not necessary you just don't need to um, I'll be honest I probably deep clean my airbrush by taking apart and um, cleaning everything maybe uh, I could run some Bailey's through uh, into my mouth um, so uh, I probably deep clean my airbrush I'm gonna say once a month at most and that's being generous. It might it might be every three months. Honestly, it's usually um, until I feel like I've I've just just trashed it to the point that I've probably got some sort of partial clog or something. Um, but it, it, it's pretty rare, guys. You just don't need to. So what I do is paint will be in here. So I take a pipette. I suck up all the paint. That's a tip from. Um, Sergio Calvo. I take up all the paint. I dump it in like an excess uh, paint uh, and water place. Then I take some cleaner. I stick it in there. And this is this is kind of a neat trip. If you stick it down in there and then you suck it up and stick it and suck it up, that motion actually is surprisingly good at cleaning. So do this a few times. Suck all that stuff out. Put it in there. Then I take some. So th I'm sorry. This is just alcohol and water. Okay, this is half alcohol, half water, um, rubbing alcohol. Um, I keep a, a, a thing around of this around. It's just super handy to have for various reasons. Um, alcohol, IPA, uh, ISO, sorry. ISO, yeah, ISO purple alcohol cleans paint off things really well. Um, this is the actual airbrush cleaner I use. It's like a third water, a third alcohol, and a third Windex. Um, the Windex helps really clean it out. Then what I'll do is I'll spray a little, I'll, I'll put a little bit of that in there, and then I'll spray it either into a paper towel, or I've got a little spray out pot here that I use sometimes. Um, it just depends. Half the time, all I do, to be honest with you, is spray it underneath my desk. Uh, there's nothing underneath my desk that I care about. Um, so, um, yeah, so that's how I clean. You'll see me do it. It'll make a lot more sense. But the reality is you really only need to clean your brush until it runs clear. Like spray it into a paper towel, um, do something until, until you realize that it runs clear. Once it runs clear, it's clean enough. Like if there's some paint like that's staying the top of the cup or something, it's fine. If you think that you have particularly abused it, um, and it, it really needs to, 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 to get clean for a little while. What I will do is I'll take and I'll back the needle out 
until it's, um, I'll, I'll, I'll do the clean that I just did first. So what I was just talking about, I'll do that first. I'll back the needle out a little bit, I'll lock it in, and then I'll just dunk this whole thing in this isopropyl alcohol for 10 minutes or so. And then pull it out and do that clean again and it's good to go. Um, but that's only if I think that I've really been abusing it. Um, all right. So let's let's put some paint down on a model. So uh, we've got this this fancy dancy ogre, right? Anytime you use your airbrush, first thing you do, um, if it's been sitting there, run some water through it. Um, if you've got dust, if you've got cleaner, if you've got something else in there, just run some water through it. Okay, that way you know that it's good to go. You know that um, that it's working. If you run water through it and it doesn't work, well then, yeah, at least you didn't put paint down in there. Um, thinner, my favorite thinner is um, Vallejo Airbrush Thinner. Um, it just works. I do not like Vallejo Airbrush Improver. Um, it creates a much longer dry time, which I am super impatient with. And if you put, um, if you put too much of it, it will keep it from drying almost forever, and it causes all sorts of adhesion issues and stuff. I do not like Flow Improver. I have a jar of it somewhere that I hate. Um, also, sometimes I'll just cut it with water. Sometimes I also cut it with ISO propyl alcohol. The advantage of ISO. Um, Aaron Lovejoy does this is that it causes it to dry a lot faster, which it, which is good on the model. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on skin tones on this model. Um, first, I'm gonna show you though how uh, people do zenithal priming. You 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 hear a lot about this. I'm a big fan of zenithal priming, but probably not for the main reasons that a lot of people do it. Um, I've got two big things that I like about it. Um, it helps you see all the details in a model. Um, it creates a, a uh, contrast over the details that lets you actually see things. When everything is black, sometimes it's really hard to tell what things are. You're looking at this and you're like, I don't, I don't know what that is. Is that a pouch? Is that a skull? Is that, you know, a boil? I don't know what that is. Um, so yeah, the other thing that it does is um, most of the time the highlights on your model are going to be uh, you know where is the little priming it's it's where the white's going to be, um, and so they're automatically going to be a little bit brighter, and then it, it sets you up where your shadows are already dark, and. If you want to put a light color down, you're not having to go over dark color. So you kind of get the benefit of both in the gracious. Um, let me think about how to put this. If, if, if we zenithal prime and we end with white and we wanted to paint yellow, we just paint yellow and we've already got dark shadows. Okay, they're, they're black, which isn't ideal, but, but that's not bad. Okay, it's not the end of the world. If we start black and we want to put yellow down, now we got to build up to white or something like that. Um, a lot of times I actually do a black, white, gray Zenithal Prime. I just like the way that it looks. It really helps me see things. Um, I think it creates a nice, even gradient to work with. So with uh, Stein Nile Res, uh, I don't thin it at all. I go uh, super high. Uh, PSI so we're just gonna and all we're doing see I'm just doing the look at that and what I'm doing is I'm keeping 45 I'm keeping an angle like this okay so I just went through and and I'm just oh, sorry airbrushing on cameras hard what I'm gonna do actually I'm gonna zoom out a little bit Make it easier to handle this here. I don't have a lot of zoom out, but I got some. Okay. Alrighty. So all we're doing is just that. All right. Now, unfortunately, Chris put way too much gray in there. Okay. So rather than spray all that gray out, which would just take way too long and honestly spraying that much solid like there's just asking for trouble. Okay, um, this is a case where we don't particularly care about specific colors, so I'm not gonna do a full flush. What I am gonna do, 
So I'm just, this is a pipette, super handy. I'm just gonna take some of our alcohol here and I'm just gonna take, and I'm just gonna do that squeeze thing that I mentioned a few times. Yep, there we go. Oop. Man, I had a lot too much in there, didn't I guys? I got a little overzealous. I could have piped the original stuff I did back into. Now if you look, we're already fairly reasonably clean. Okay, for what we're doing with the xenolithal priming, that's clean enough. We're gonna put a little water through there. You never want to mix your cleaner um, into your uh, paint. That's just asking for trouble. So we put a little water, we sucked it out. Okay, we're just gonna spray it out now. There we go. All right, so we're ready for white. Okay, we're gonna do a little white. Oh, people are like, people are leaving. They're like, this either sucks or they thought it was something else or they're just done. All right, so now all we're gonna do is we're gonna send up a prime and there we go. Look at that. All right, so at this point now, what, what we've done is we've created a nice gradient over the model just to kind of show what it is. And we're doing just short bursts, right? Quitters, dang straight. Um, and and all we were doing was short bursts. We're just doing short bursts, okay? <laughs> just the winners. You guys get a prize. I don't know what that is. If you're here at the end, though, uh, shoot, if you're listening to this and you're here at the end, I'm not going to repeat this because it's only for the people that are here. If you're here right now and you make it to the end, um, shoot me a note on Facebook. Let me know. So I'll send you guys something. I'll do something. I don't know. Something. All right. So at this point, we've gotten, we've just created a bit of a gradient here. Um, so at this point, we're going to do a quick clean because we need to um, get some real paint in there. So you can see all I'm doing is I'm just sucking that up. We don't want to spray junk through our airbrush unless we have to. Um, we're going to take... Uh, just a little ISO, we're gonna spray, we're just gonna suck, look at that. See, look, we're already almost clean. Okay, okay we're just gonna suck this out, we're gonna spray that out. Okay, we're gonna put a little, we're just gonna put a little bit of this in there, okay? And then, oh, you know what, I forgot one thing. Let me get a paper towel. We do need, when you clean, you do need to back flush. So what that means is you're preventing the air from escaping and you're going back in there and you'll see it bubble. What that does is that's clearing this stuff out. Okay, we're gonna suck that out because we just cleared a bunch of stuff out from there. We don't want to blow that back out unless we have to. Okay, we do that. Let's drop a little bit of cleaner. Spray that out. All right, guys, we're good to go. That is, that's how I clean an airbrush. That's it, that is, I, I don't do any more than that at the end of the day. Um, one thing, if you do have a lot of paint dried on your tip, you can pull that off. Um, you can use your fingernail, you can use a brush, you can do whatever. I just don't get real anal about it. The way that I work, it doesn't um, seem to make a difference, to be honest with you. All right, let's do some skin. Let's, uh, let's speed dry this with the airbrush. We're just gonna spray some air. I'm just gonna take more. Any questions, comments, concerns? You're like, what the heck? This guy does not know what he's talking about. Okay. All right. So so far, we've just covered the basics of how an airbrush works, some tips, some tricks, stuff like that. Nothing major. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start putting paint on the model. All right. At this point, it's pretty much done. I think I put that white down with the gray a little too wet. That's causing a little bit of weirdness on the model, but we're just gonna run with it. All right, I am going to... Um, yes, yeah, I, I would not normally do that. Like, um, it, yes and no. So, if the paint is pooling enough that you're moving around you put too much down um you should be able to speed speed dry it like that within reason um i don't normally though that's pretty rare um 
trying to think if I've ever had that cause issues. The only time I've ever really had had that cause issues is when I just got overzealous priming. And if you speed dry it, what happens on a pool with the with the primer is it is it on a pool of paint it'll dry the top layer first, form a film, and um, and then that causes a problem because the paint is not drying evenly. Um, but yeah, that really only happens if you're putting too much down. I don't think I've ever had that that actually cause an issue. All right, so what we're going to do now is we're going to um, we're going to we're going to do some skin on this ogre, and all we're going to do is just do some basic things. I'm going to take some pro acryl here. I'm going to work with much large, much um, thicker paint dilution than I normally would to start off with here because we're just trying to get some colors down. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to put just a little bit of airbrush thinner, I'm almost out, um, in the bottom of the cup. You want to do that because you don't want the paint to dry in the bottom of the cup. Okay, we're going to put a little bit of paint. Um, I want this a little more red for the shadows. Some people mix in the cup, some people mix externally. I've done both in my life. Yeah, it just depends on the mood I'm in. If I'm mixing a lot of one color, I will do that. Um, that is not the brush I thought it was. That is also not the brush I thought it was. Oh no, do I not have a... Oh, just a second, I gotta reach and grab a mixing brush here. I didn't have one. Oh lordy, what just happened? Ah! Can you guys still hear me? My audio mixer just dropped. Am I still there? I think I'm still there. Okay, good. I didn't realize how short my microphone cable was. Mm, one moment to forward. That is the extent of my Spanish right there, guys. All right. All right. All right, all we're gonna do is, I just got a little, one of these cheap brushes, get a little wet, and then we're just gonna stick it down in here and mix some of that. All right. Um, I made a big mess of things though when that happened. Alrighty. My phone is really taking a beating tonight, guys. Alright, so now what we're gonna do is after we've done that, we never want to, we've just mixed up the paint in the cup, what we don't want to do is immediately now start spraying the model. Like the first time you test it should not be on the model. You know, give it a little bit of whatever. Yep, look at that. That's about what I want, okay. We're gonna crank this down. This seems a little um, bit, bit much of air. We're gonna lower this a little bit. There we go, something about like that, yep. And then we're just going to, we're just doing short, Short and somebody's going, well, why did you bother to Zenopo Prime? Well, that's because, like I said, I really wanted the base values there. It'll influence a lot of things. If we don't get somewhere, if we forget to paint a little bit, something like that, we have already got it in a dark area then and it's gonna be way less noticeable that's one thing I hate about those whiz kids minis is that they're primed white so if you like have a shadow that's hard to reach or you forget something or whatever you now have like this white spotlight um, exactly free shading there we go look at that so we're not having to worry super about making sure we got a lot of things because we've already got um, all right look at that all right so at this point that's one all right so what what I've done now is I've I've covered the whole bunch of skin in the skin tone right I'm just making sure I get everything and you can see I was using the same short bursts I was not um, I was not spraying, right? So what we got was we got a nice even coverage. Oh, we're gonna make sure we got some right down in there. Yep. And I didn't have to worry about any spidering. I didn't, because we were just doing nice, real short bursts. All right, 
Now what we do, we got a little bit of paint left in the cup. We're gonna be working in the same kind of palette, so we really don't have to worry about like getting all of the paint. Get the left leg in the back. Did I miss, oh, I missed toes too, look at that. Yep, oh, you're right. Alrighty. I was in too much of a hurry there, wasn't I, guys? Alrighty. I think we're good now. Alrighty. Alright. So, um, there we go. Alright, so now what we do is we've got a little bit of, um, paint left in the cup. We don't want to spray all that paint through. Remember, we're trying to, to put as little paint to give us a clog as possible. So I'm gonna take some of this, uh, this alcohol and water here, put it in, fill it up, just kind of suction that out a little bit like that. Put that in our paint dump that we, just a spare cup, we're gonna suck all that out, look at that. Okay. I'm not gonna do any more than that for this color change. Okay, because we're still in the same palette. Um, I might spray it out just to, yeah. So we'll just do that. You know, if we if we feel compelled to put a little bit of water in there, we can do that. Um, the reality is, guys, you know, if you want to get it super clean, you can. You just don't need to. Like, it's just totally not necessary. There we go. All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take... Um, we're going to skip a bunch of tones than you would normally do. Your aim is great. I find mine goes more left. It might be a bent needle. So if your needle tip is just slightly bent, then that's um, what I was talking about earlier, if you were here for that. Um, a bent needle will, will cause that to go slightly in one direction. Um, so again, we're putting just a little bit of um, thinner in there. All right, this is where we're going to start to thin a little bit more than normal. We're going um, a little bit brighter than you than you would if you um, were doing this by brush. We're, we get to skip some steps because the angle of the airbrush is naturally going to help us out. Um, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to we're going to thin this down considerably. So I put some in there. I'm going to put a little bit more in there. I am really running out though. Alrighty, and you can see I did not measure that, but I've got a pretty good amount of thinner. I probably got three or four, maybe maybe more thinner to paint in there. Um, this is just because I like it thinner like I talked about earlier. And all I did was mix that up. Again, we're not gonna go straight to the model. Like, don't do that. We need to test this out, make sure it's good. Yeah, so see, we're getting, we're getting the kind of color that I want there. Okay, we're gonna crank it down just a slight bit, not much. All right, now here's the trick. We don't want to aim right like this. Okay, we don't wanna aim like this. We're doing this similar to Zenithal, where we're only, we're gonna stay in this 45 relative to the model. And again, we're just doing short bursts. And at this point, we're, we're basically kind of Zenithaling, but we're trying to be, somewhat controlled okay you can see that skin starting to to take shape a little bit okay airbrush skin without any brushwork often doesn't look right I, I almost never only airbrush skin so at the end of the day here I would not call this done without some some additional brushwork. Okay, I'm just doing these short little bursts. I'm not worrying about overage. Okay, and all we're trying to do is make sure that we're establishing volumes. Okay, okay. All right, so what happens here though, is we, 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 we start to lose contrast in places. And I'm gonna show you when, 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 we, when we work up 
how we, we work with that. So again, we're just doing these short bursts, okay? Now, because I put a lot of thinner in there, um, we, we really don't uh, have, to, you know what, I'm gonna go a little bit more here. I'm gonna, we're gonna lay this coat down just a little brighter in some places, particularly in the front here. So what we wanna do is we wanna create a zone of focus around the face, so we're gonna put it brighter there. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna do a little more. Okay, I just wasn't real happy with that. It's a little too pastel. Okay, all right. Okay, so now what we're gonna do though is we're gonna suck this paint out. We're gonna move up one more color for now. And then we're going to start reinforcing some shadows and stuff. Okay. With airbrushing, what tends to happen as you airbrush lighter is you lose a lot of your shadows. Um, your, your, you, you inevitably end up um, uh, losing some of your shadows. So I'm getting this a little more clean right now because I want to make sure as we go brighter that I don't have any of my 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 shadow color in there that would be bad so all i'm going to do though is just spray this out you can see i'm this is not a time intensive thing i'm just making sure that the spray is clean spraying that thinner out all right that's good enough for me I'm toss a little water in there you can see this is not hard guys nothing we've done so far somebody should be like oh my gosh I can't believe he just did that nothing is good nothing is, is insane yet all right we're gonna take this is pale pink okay we're gonna use this as a as the highlight color for now um, if I was um, oh crap I should have put sorry I wasn't thinking I should have put some of this in there first not the end of the world all right and we're gonna mix this up um, doing this as like a competition or a high level commission, um, I will go all the way to like a bright ivory on skin in small places. Again, we're testing it on um, some other surface to make sure we like what it does. You never go straight to your model. All right, at this point, we're staying at it. All right, we started, we did everything. When we did this, we did about here. We're gonna try to stay a little higher, but we're gonna be real selective. We're gonna pick where we want the focus to be. So we're gonna turn it down a little bit more. That's a little too low, all right. And I'm gonna focus on the head here. Again, I'm just doing these real small, Okay, we're gonna hit the knee a little bit here. Okay, we've, this looks a little crazy, but trust me, it'll, it'll, we're just establishing volumes here, guys. Okay. So the problem here is that we've lost a lot of our shadows here. Okay, at this point, this is, I'm gonna reinforce this one more time, there we go. All right, so what I like to do at this point now, is switch to a paint that is not, I'm gonna go ahead and clean this out while I'm talking. Um, so what I like to do at this point is switch to a paint that is not fully um, opaque. What that will do is as I paint things, it will blend the layers together a lot better. Okay guys, um, all the paints we've been using now are high pigment, very opaque paints that want to cover each other. That is not what we're gonna do anymore. And so somebody's thinking, well, what do we have? What do you have in your arsenal that is not like a super opaque paint? Well, you can use transparents. Um, if you've got like Pro Acryl transparents. Um, sorry, I'm working on a, trying to do this clean here. All right, I'm gonna call that good enough. Um, all right, so, but one of the other more common options that a lot of people have is they have washes. Okay, I'm gonna use, this is, this is um, GW Flesh Wash. I just put it in a dropper bottle because I'm not a moron. Um, 
And what we're gonna do is we're gonna spray some flesh wash um, just from a downward angle, and you're gonna see it's gonna bring back a lot of contrast into our skin, okay? We're gonna use this undiluted at a relatively high PSI. And this is the advantage, I've been adjusting my PSI up and down, you, you've heard me say up and down, just with a little twist of this knob. Okay, this has not been me. So what we're gonna do is we're only staying from below now. Okay, we're, we're not quite here, we're about like this, okay? And again, all we're doing is just little, so see how it's starting to bring some color back? Little bit of shadows back, okay? Now, let's see, we've, now we can start being a little more selective. There we go. You know, maybe we want these areas to be a lot darker, right? Is there whatever we can, you're gonna have a lot more control over your darks than your lights. Lights are just much harder to spray, okay? So get your, get your lights up where they need to be and then come back in and work more with your darks. It's just a lot easier, okay? We're gonna focus right in here in this armpit and then we're gonna come right across here. There we go, look at that. All right, now with the face, we're gonna come in. We're gonna do some of that. Okay. We're gonna come right across this foot. Okay. All we're doing is we're just working at this angle, little bitty bursts, adding some some color and some shadows back in. Okay. This is never going to replace brush entirely, but you can see that we've really we're going to see if we can get right in this fold here to make this a little more whatever. We're going to have to have a lot lower. Uh, pressure for this because we're going to try to be a little more precise. I'm not sure how much luck we're going to have with this, but we'll see. Okay, a little too hard still. So all I'm doing is just fine sprays. There we go. All we did was just reinforce that shadow just a little bit. Alright, now the reality is we still need a lot more uh, darker shadows on places to create some some good colors. Um, we've got a lot of bright, but we really don't have that dark, okay? And again, all of this is just setting it up so that you can come back in and tweak it with your, I just had a tiny bit left, so I'm just spraying it out in a paper towel here. All right. It's just so you can come back in and finish with your brush. We're trying to get a good solid foundation. Okay, um, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take purple. I love purple in deep dark shadows. It looks amazing. And I really like um, Purple Tone by Army Painter. I've also got some of the, what is it, uh, Drushi Violet, also really good stuff. Um, I just don't have as much experience airbrushing that. So I, I just haven't used that as much. And all we're gonna do is we're gonna come hit our deepest, darkest places here. Okay, and we're just gonna hit under the arms right there. We're gonna hit under his, and we're, we're coming at a much steeper angle now. We really wanna make sure that we don't hit any of our highlights here, okay? So we're just hitting the places that really Okay, you can see we got a little bit of spidering there. We're just gonna blow that in the direction we want it to go. And we can come and fix that with a brush if we want just a little too heavy. That happened because I started talking and wasn't doing my 10% sprays as much. All right, so you can see now. All right, we're gonna come back and We're just trying to catch 
right under there. There we go. And then we're going to catch right around his belly edge. We're just doing little light passes just to give him some color. Okay. All right, so there we go. We've got some skin. He's, he's a little white on the head. We can fix that if we want. Um, this is where you would come back in with a brush, but you can see we, I don't know, we didn't spend very long at all, but we established a lot of um, tones and volumes in there in very little time. Okay. So airbrushing, questions, comments, helpful, not helpful. Uh, thanks. This is just where we would start. This is, this is um, what you do. Now, what I would do, to be honest with you, is I would come back in, uh, do a bunch of brushwork, um, take things like um, some of the, um, the darker tones and, you know, put them in there, define this edge better, you know, define all the muscles a lot better. I would um, take, you know, the skin tone here, make sure that this was highlighted a little bit better. And then I might come back at the very end and do some glazes. Um, so just very thin, um, very thin bursts of the skin tone just to kind of blend everything together. Okay. So you can see we got a real nice transition here on the back with extremely little work. I mean, it just, it, it took basically nothing here to, 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 to do this. Um, the, the trick here is that somebody's, at, at this point now, you kind of have to be careful painting all these details. Um, because if you, if you just go nuts and get paint everywhere on the skin now, you kind of just hosed up your whole airbrushing job, okay? The airbrush is not the right tool for every, um, yeah, I would use brushwork for all these accessories. This is probably the only thing I would, I would airbrush all the skin. I would, I would paint the entire rest of the model, and then I'll tell you what I do a lot of times um, after I'm all done with a model is I will take something like sepia ink um, that I, I just really like it and I'll come in over an entire model and I'll just do like a quick one, one, two, one, two, just to give reinforce almost all the shadows from beneath with just kind of a warmer um, sepia tone because almost all the time we're talking about minis that are outside and that reflected ground um, whether it's dirt grass anything except for stone is going to give you um, a real warm reflection so airbrushing something like a, a, a sepia a burnt sienna um, something that's got some warmth and is just just a little bit of dark is going to really um, going to really help so yeah all right guys um i don't really have anything else planned is there anything else you want to see i don't really feel like cleaning this uh right now just because i'm tired of doing it so i'm just gonna leave it in there i just drop it in there that's it um oh one, one thing um when you're done with your airbrush i'm gonna grab my my other one here when you're done with your airbrush for the day um, let's say maybe you um, didn't do a good job cleaning. Um, you did everything right, but you didn't do a good job cleaning. Uh, wet paint won't dry. So all you gotta do is when you're all done, just take, before you put your brush away, just put a little bit of cleaning fluid or something in there, and then just set your brush upright wherever you keep it. Like. Try to keep your brushes somewhere where where they can sit up like this because if you just leave a little bit of fluid in there, then nothing is ever gonna dry in there and cause all sorts of issues. So I always pack my airbrushes away with a little bit of water or a little bit of um, uh, cleaning fluid on them. It just, it, it makes life so much easier. How much to spend on an airbrush? Um, so, I have experience with a Wada and I have experience with a Badger. Um, I don't have experience with, with Grex or HS. 
Um, I have experience with the the Chinese uh, eBay ones. Um, it's just a lot of it really depends on, on what you're looking for. Um, I like the Badgers for, for a few reasons. Um, I like that they're an American company. Um, I know Ken. Uh, I watched the booth at uh, Origins for Ken for a while. Um, convinced some surgeon to buy an airbrush. Um, so I like uh, I like the Badger culture. Um, so and I like the Badger prices for replacement parts. Um, if you break something, if um, if you you lose something, it's not on a slow boat from China. It's not going to cost you an arm and a leg. It, it's 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 reasonably priced. Um, Badger brushes run anywhere from when they're not on the the birthday sale. Run anywhere from like sixty five to one hundred and twenty ish. I want to say, um, and then you're going to need a compressor. Um, for a compressor, I highly recommend getting one with um, a tank on it. A tank saves a lot of issues with compressors. It acts as a first line moisture filter. Um, due to the nature of compressed air, traveling through a hose and everything if there's a lot of water in the line as the motor runs it will heat up the air in the uh, air compressor and then as it uh, cools down coming through the line it will collect moisture moisture will shoot out through the airbrush and ruin your paint job I have actually to my knowledge never seen that happen with me it's possible uh, I, I just I've never seen it happen and I live in Georgia where it should be happening all the time. I contribute that to the fact that I have um, both a water trap and a tanked air compressor. So the, the, the air compressor when it runs does not heat up the air in the tank as much as it would if it was just doing it live. Um, a good compressor is going to run you around 80 to 100 or decent compressor. I wouldn't call it a good compressor. Um, and then you need a hose. You need some sort of airbrush stand, cleaner, um, pipettes. Um, I've got a I've got a page that I'll show. I usually tell people to budget around two hundred to two fifty total for for a reasonable setup. Um, if you go with a Wada, if you go with H and S. Um, plan closer to the 250 to 300 mark um, if you go uh, with a really high-end Awada custom micro the sky is kind of the limit you're looking at you know 500 for the brush uh, alone depending on which brush um, yeah so you, you got a lot of options um, I, I just happen to be a Badger fan I, I like the brushes so yeah uh, any other questions comments We're right at 90 minutes, which is pretty decent. All right, if there is no more questions or comments, I am going to wrap this up. I think I've got a little bit of Bailey's left to finish. And yeah. Oop. Oh, I don't even know if I'm going to finish this guy. This was just for, for test purposes. Um, but this is the same process. This is the exact same process. Um, that I used on the Ogre that uh, has the OSL on it um, that, that I did for the skin. I did the, the, the shading just like I did. Um, I came back in with brushwork and then I would uh, smooth it out with the airbrush um, kind of towards the end. Um, yeah, if you look at the, the OSL Ogre with the glowing uh, crystal, he's very similar setup. Um, yeah, let me think, anything else? I made notes about what to talk about. I hit all my notes. Um, if you're curious about how I do OSL, I talked about it on the video that's on YouTube um, where I did the OSL for the Ogre live on camera. Um, I do it with an airbrush as well. Um, uh, yeah. So, yeah. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. Speak now or forever hold your peace. All righty. Thanks, everybody.